So last time we looked at Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 1 and we discovered very quickly how Mary was a sinner, how she rejoiced in God her Saviour. She needed a Saviour to be saved, all have sinned and all come short of the glory of God. Mary was no exception. So how amazing it was for Mary, a 15 year old girl, to give birth to the Son of God who would later go on to save her. It's quite remarkable. We also discovered how Zacharias and Elizabeth were cousins to Mary. Elizabeth was Mary's cousin, so Jesus and John are second cousins. Cousins, Quite amazing, quite amazing. And of course the Lord chose Zacharias and Elizabeth to be the parents of John the Baptist. It could have been anyone, but he chose them because he knew how they would be able to cope with someone like John who would be the prophet of the highest. Quite remarkable. And they were chosen for service, not salvation. They were already saved, of course, before she fell pregnant with John and, you know, the rest. His ministry was to prepare the way, to prepare the arrival of the Messiah. So, like I say, Matthew 1, Luke 1, a good uh, taster, a good start to the new year. For those of you that are wanting to get back into the scriptures, for those of you that want to get deeper into the word of God, for those of you that may not even be saved and are going to get saved in 2014, Maybe this video will be a blessing to you. Maybe my last video, The Secret to Slaying Sin, will be a blessing to you. I will say this, there's no silver bullet when it comes to dealing with the problem of sin. Uh, we all have the issue of battling, battling sin. You know, once you're born again, the only real way of dealing with the sins of the flesh is through the scriptures, the Bible, the Word of God. Jesus Christ saves you from all of your past, present and future sins, but the Holy Spirit expects you to walk in Him he expects you to be in the scriptures each and every day and when you do those things you can overcome sin. So take the Bible seriously, don't give it lip service, read it each and every day, study it, apply it and if you are able to, teach it to others. But above all, do something. So let's continue on as we were last time, we finished in Luke chapter 1, like I say, realising how Mary was a sinner and how she needed to be saved. She wasn't a queen of heaven. She was a very good, godly girl who gave birth to the Son of God. And once Jesus Christ was born, her ministry finished. She ceased. So what you don't want to do is fall into the trap of praying to third parties. I've used this analogy before. If you have the phone number of the Queen of England or the President of America, you don't need to go through their servants to contact them. If the Queen has given you her phone number, the President has given you his phone number, you go straight to the top. Don't waste time going through third parties. Take it to the top. Okay, let's start, if we may, for this uh, video in Mark chapter 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The beginning of the gospel, the beginning of the Lord's ministry, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Last time I showed you how Matthew traces Jesus Christ back to the Son of David. Son of David, son of Joseph, the son of David, of course, is his Davidic title. Jesus Christ is a king and he will have a literal kingdom. At the moment, if you are saved, you are in the spiritual kingdom. When Jesus Christ comes back at the end of the tribulation, you will be in his physical kingdom. The kingdom of God also and the kingdom of heaven are the same thing, I believe. But like I said, they have two different aspects to it. Son of God is obviously his deity. He's very God and very man. And uh, verse 2, this is in reference to John the Baptist coming to prepare the way of the Lord. L-O-R-D, uppercase, always in reference to Jehovah God. Verse 3, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John is speaking about Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ here is referred to as Jehovah God. Elohim, El Gabor, Adonai, whatever name you wish to call God. <laughs> Uh, nevertheless, the Jews had only one God which they believed in, Jehovah God. Verse 4, John did baptise in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the mission of sins. John put you into water, Jesus Christ puts you into the Spirit. When you go to Acts 19, you find Paul coming across some disciples of John. And he says to them, have you received the Holy Spirit? Or since you received the Holy Spirit, what have you been doing? And these men hadn't even heard of the Holy Spirit. They were completely oblivious as to who the Holy Spirit was. Now, had they been Jews, they would have known, of course, who the Holy Spirit was. It's my understanding they were quite possibly proselytes. They converted from 
paganism, they were Gentiles, they'd gone over to Judaism, they'd heard about the coming Messiah, and they got baptised in the River Jordan, awaiting his arrival. Paul then prays over them, he baptises them spiritually and physically, and they speak in tongues. Of course the Holy Spirit baptises them, you understand, into the body of Christ. But Paul, at that point, is, is acting as a sort of an agent, if you will, and they speak in tongues. They were men, they were proselytes, you don't find women speaking in tongues in the New Testament. But here John is going to baptise you into water. That won't save you, you know, if you've been baptised in water as an infant, as a young person, and you're now living like the devil, it's quite obvious that water did not save you. Verse 5, And there went out unto him all the land of Judea, and they of Jerusalem, and were all baptised of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. They confessed their sins to God, not to John. When you first got saved, you called on the name of the Lord, and he saw you, he heard you, and only he saw you, and only he saved you. That's justification in the sight of God, Romans chapter 4. But once you got saved, you were baptised by water in the presence of others. An outward act demonstrating an inward act. Others saw your faith, others realised that you were born again, and they were able to see that you were now born again. So Romans 4 deals with justification in the sight of God, whereas James chapter 2 demonstrates justification in the sight of man. Verse 6, And John was clothed with camel's hair, and with a girdle of a skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey, and preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. Can you imagine this man? He's been out in the desert for years. He's dressed rather inappropriately by today's standards. And uh, he's preaching hellfire. He's calling on people to repent. And all of the religious fathers, scholars, PhDs, what have you, wanted nothing to do with him. It's amazing that the Lord Jesus Christ didn't choose any of the religious establishments to represent him. He chose ordinary people. He chose fishermen, and he chose his second cousin, cousin to pronounce his arrival. Verse 8, I indeed have baptised you with the water, but he shall come, but he shall baptise you with the Holy Ghost. Excuse me, one more time, verse 8. I indeed have baptised you with water, but he shall baptise you with the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians chapter 4. When you called on the name of the Lord, you were baptised at that moment into the body of Christ. No works were involved. Once you got saved, you should have been baptised in the water. Total immersion. When I got saved, or soon after got saved, Patrick and I went to Israel, and I baptised him, and he baptised me in the River Jordan. It didn't save us, but we were already saved, of course. Uh, verse 9, And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and was baptised of John in Jordan. He didn't need to be baptised, he was without sin. But he's demonstrating something that he wants others to follow. Public baptism where possible. And also to be identified with him. You know, people that got saved in the first century paid a huge price for following the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't easy for them. Verse 10, And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened, and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven, saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Coming up straight out of the water. It's total immersion. There's no way around it. Sprinkling isn't what you want. Uh, if you want to get baptised, if you can be baptised, try and get it done by total immersion. And here the Holy Spirit comes from heaven and descends upon him. And verse 11, God the Father says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Father, Son and Holy Spirit found in two verses. Not the oneness position, which I spoke about briefly last time, how Jesus and the Spirit and the Father are all one and somehow they all speak to one another. That's very confusing, confusing. Uh, as a Trinitarian, I believe that the Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Spirit is a person. But they are still one God. Verse 12, And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness, the Holy Spirit, of course. And he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan, and was with the, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. He goes into the wilderness, he's going to be tested by the devil, and this is one of the, uh, this is this is a part of scripture which is very uh, mysterious as to why he was baptized. First of all, we know why, of course, to set to set an example for us. Uh, but even more mysteriously is why he was then tempted in the wilderness by the devil, and he he was with the wild beasts. But the angels came and ministered unto him. That's a one-off ministry, really. I mean, Paul went into the desert for a while. Uh, but apart from Paul, you don't find anybody else in the New Testament that went through this. 
So I don't think we need to put ourselves you know, in the, the wilderness. I know I'm pretty high up at the moment, my favourite open air pulpit. <laughs> But uh, I won't be up here for 40 days and 40 nights, and I won't be up here without any water or food. You know, I'll be up here for about an hour, and then I'll go home. But uh, the Lord was there for many days. And of course, he was victorious. You know, where Adam stumbled, where Adam failed, Jesus Christ conquered death and overcame all sin. Being the second Adam, of course. Verse 14, Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. This word repentance seems to be seems to become rather uh, controversial. It simply means to change your mind. It simply means to turn from a position of unbelief to belief and then turn to the Lord and receive him. People say, well, you've got to turn from all of your sins in order to be saved. You can't do that, people. You're born in sin. David said he was uh, shapen in iniquity. He was conceived in lust. We are born in sin, original sin. We've all got the same problem of original sin. So when people say you've got to turn from all of your sins to then be saved, forget it. It's impossible. But you are expected to, to change your mind. I mean, in Acts 17, when the Apostle Paul came across all these unsaved pagans, he didn't say to them, stay as you are, the Lord will receive you as you are. You know, you've all got your own little private truth. He said, no, repent. For God has chosen a day when he will judge the world through Jesus Christ. So you need to repent if you haven't repented need to change your mind as to who God is, as to who the Lord Jesus Christ is, and call out to him and believe the gospel. Verse 16, Now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers, fishermen, the first of two brothers, to be spotted and called for service. Not necessarily salvation, they could have been saved already, but here they are being chosen for service. 17, And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I'll make you to become fishers of men, literally fishermen, soul winners. 18. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. That's incredible. These men had their own businesses, and they left everything to follow him. That's a true call to service, to follow the Lord, to follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. 19. And when he had gone a little farther thence, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, who also were in the ship mending their nets. Another group of brothers. As I said, Jesus was cousins with John, second cousins, and Elizabeth was first cousins with Elizabeth, excuse me, Mary was first cousins with Elizabeth, excuse me. So you see the Lord is very much looking at families here. He wants to save families where he can. Verse 20, and straightway he called them, and they left their, they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants, and went after him. These men were lower middle class, they had their own businesses, and they had servants. Pretty wealthy men to do, but not religious. They weren't priests, they weren't uh, full-time pastors or reverence or uh, scholars, they were just ordinary fishermen. Quite remarkable how the Lord God snubbed the world of organised religion when he came into the world. And for the most part, apart from Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, they had no idea as to who he was. And it'll be the same when he comes at the second coming. Most, most, of the second, most people at the second coming who are religious today will have no idea who he is and they'll be cast into the lake of fire. Verse 21. And they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into their synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. You can imagine it, doing miracles left, right and centre. And these synagogues later became places of worship for the early Jewish community. You know, we are critical of organised religion, but we're not critical of uh, church buildings per se. I know some people are, but we're not. The early church did meet in synagogues once they got born again. The Gentiles met in homes for the most part, but the Jews had the structure in place. They took the synagogues over and they became places of worship. I think also from the Old Testament going into the New Testament, to have a synagogue which was valid, you needed about 12 men to form a synagogue. Jesus says in Matthew 18, where two or three gather in my name, they are mine, the midst of thee. So he says two or three people together in my name, breaking bread each week, that's fine. That constitutes a church, at least two or three. Uh, verse 23, And there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What are we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. The Holy One of God, another term for his deity, and he says, uh, Let us, plural, alone. What have we, singular, to do with thee? Fascinating. 
Maybe there's more than one spirit here, or that the spirit spoken of in the singular. But this man is speaking to the Lord, and of course it's the devil behind the man speaking to the Lord. This, of course, is demon possession, and demon possession is still prevalent today. And you find these people that are demon possessed, for the most part, being very religious. You know, inverted crosses, uh, always dressed in black, sort of gothically in some ways. So that, that, that doesn't necessarily mean they are possessed. They all dress, they, you know, they dress in black all the time. I should qualify that but they have a religious interest. They're very religious. You don't find any atheists in the Bible either, and nor will you find any atheists uh, in hell. But he says here, let us alone or leave us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Uh, the cross reference to this, which I think is found in Matthew, says, have you come to torment us? Uh, of course, Jesus will torment all sin at the end of the world. And Revelation 14 speaks about this in more detail. Verse 25, and Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. Just a word, just one word, and this devil came out of the man. No wonder they were shocked at his doctrine from 22 and his practice. This man healed everyone. Whoever came to him to be healed was healed, unlike many of the charlatans today. 26, and when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. You bet he came out. When Jesus says, Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth, Lazarus came forth. If he hadn't said Lazarus, all of the dead would come up out of the tombs, found in John 5 and John 6. You know, when he says, come forth, everyone is going to come forth. All the dead are going to be resurrected to be judged. But he says in that piece of scripture, in John 11, Lazarus, come forth. Just Lazarus. And here, one word, hold thy peace and come out of him. And that spirit came out of him. Amazing. Verse 27, and they were all amazed insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. You better believe it. You better believe it. The unclean spirits obeyed him. Satan obeyed him. Satan tried to tempt him. And in Matthew 4, he says, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God, in reference to Jesus Christ, of course. The devil couldn't touch him. But if he messes with you, if the devil gets his hooks into you, your fall fast. Paul fell, Peter fell, David fell, Solomon fell, Lot fell, Jacob fell. The devil is very powerful. You don't want to mess with the devil. You don't want to mess with the occult. You don't want to mess with the unclean spirits. You need to do all things through Jesus Christ. And some of these people say, well, we can cast out devils and we, we can rebuke the devil. We can bind them. Forget it. You're kidding yourself. Do it through the, through the Holy Spirit. Even Michael didn't dare bring an accusation against uh, Lucifer when they fought over the body of Moses. Verse um, 28, and immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all of the region round about Galilee. You can bet it did. You know, I've always thought that Paul would have known about the Lord Jesus. Paul was part of the religious elite at that time and no doubt uh, Pilate had his own secret police watching the Lord Jesus, hearing about the Lord Jesus and they knew what he was doing. This carpenter, which has come out of nowhere, almost from obscurity, going around healing people, raising the dead, preaching a message, you know, of love and repentance and uh, self-sacrifice, you know, it was unheard of, unprecedented, and his fame has gone abroad. 29 and forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and Anon they tell him of her. And he came and took her by the hand, and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, as she ministered unto him. Peter was married, and had children. This house is quite possibly Peter's house. Most of the apostles, but not all, but most were married. We're not sure about Paul. Paul may not have been married. We're not sure about John either, but there was nothing in scripture to prohibit uh, people being married. First, Timothy chapter 4 speaks about people in the last days that put a ban, a blanket ban on marriage. How bizarre. Why would you stop somebody want, from wanting to be married? You go to the Catholic Church, you see all their priests, they're not, they're not allowed to be married. And that's weird. And the scriptures is demonic. You know, because man is a woman, woman is a man. Man was made for woman, a woman was made for man. Uh, but of course, man was made first and woman was cloned from man. She takes her father's name, of course, until she's married. And once she gets married, she takes her husband's name. And if they have children, the children take the father's name. You know, this is the fact of the matter. Woman was made for man, but nevertheless, man needs a woman. Woman needs a man, as the old song goes, you know. Um, but uh, here, Peter was married, and his 
mother-in-law was sick. I'm not saying it was demonic. It could have been uh, just some ailment she was suffering from. But the Lord dealt with it. And she was healed straight away. Immediately, it says in verse 31. You don't find it happening today. You don't find people being healed immediately. Uh, and I'll tell you a quick story about that in a minute, if I may. Verse 32. And at evening, or even, another word for evening, when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased, and them that were possessed with devils. Devils, people say it should be called demons, not necessarily. There's one devil, Satan, Lucifer, but there are many devils, demons, minions, that fell. I think a third fell with Satan when Satan rebelled against God. And it says it one more time, at even, when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased, and then that were possessed with devils. Maybe to avoid the stigma, you had an unsaved relative who was possessed by a demon, screaming and shouting and dribbling. It would have been quite embarrassing to bring this person out in the daytime for, for all of the people to see. So they did it at night time. A bit like uh, Nicodemus, he travelled to see Jesus at night. Some people say he did it because he was worried about being spotted. Quite possibly, you know, he was a priest, he was pretty high up, he was a scholar, he was a, uh, a well-to-do individual. But he went out by night, under the cover of night. And these people came out at night time, and they were all healed. Look at 33. And all the city were gathered together at the door. And he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases, and cast out many devils, and suffered not the devils to speak, because they knew him. They knew him. Unclean spirits knew who he was. He wasn't just Michael. Well, he wasn't Michael, I should say. He wasn't just a good man. He wasn't just a prophet. He's the Holy One. He's the Just One. He's Jehovah God. And he says, you're not going to speak out as to who I am. Only my elect, only those whom I have chosen to know who I am, will know who I am. Most of these people are not going to know who I am. Because through foreknowledge, through middle knowledge, they are never going to be saved. They are not the Lord's people. It's a bit like a secret society, really, isn't it, in some ways. You know, when we get saved, you know, we have sacred things which we only share with one another. We don't discuss the deep things of the Lord with unsaved people. Because it's foolishness to them. Uh, and also, they could turn around and rend you in pieces. That's what the Bible says, don't cast your pearls before swine. Give them, give them the gospel, tell them they need to repent, and if they get saved, wonderful. And if they don't get saved, shut the book up. It's not for them. Uh, 35, and in the morning, rising up a great while, before day he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there prayed. I think it's Luke 6, the cross-reference, where he prayed all night before he chose his apostles. They weren't chosen before the foundation of the world. They were chosen in time. The Lord could have chosen anyone from 72 people. He had the 12 apostles, the 12 apostles, and he had the 70. Matthew 10, Luke 10. And out of those 72 people, he chose 12, which went on to become apostles. But they weren't chosen before the foundation of the world. They were chosen in time. 36. And Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. Yep, they wanted to seek him out. They wanted to be fed physically. They wanted to see his miracles. They didn't, seek, they didn't uh, search him out necessarily to be saved. And it's like today, a lot of people go to churches. They go to these you know, religious conventions to have an experience. To be part of something religious. Not to be saved. They come to hear about God, not to meet God. And that's why so many people are found in Matthew 7, 21 screaming out to the Lord, we did all these things in your name, and he says, I never knew you. You were never saved to begin with. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. 38, and he said unto them, let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also, for therefore came I forth. And he preached in the synagogues throughout all Galilee, and cast out devils. Again, synagogues, this is very much the Jewish aspect of the Jewish Messiah. He comes to his own first of all. He goes to the places of worship, which later became places for saved Jews. And possibly Gentiles too, to meet and worship in. Uh, but nevertheless, his ministry here is to heal people that were possessed, set them free, and hopefully see them get saved. Many people did get saved before Pentecost, uh, but more got saved after Pentecost. Uh, verse 40, And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. He touched him. Something unprecedented. The king of the universe has taken on human form, and he's touched somebody with leprosy, an awful illness, an awful disease, which I believe is returning in parts of the world in the 21st century. 
You can just imagine the Pharisees being shocked that this young rabbi, 31, 32 years old perhaps, is now physically touching people with leprosy. Incredible. But he was a man of the people. He came unto those that wanted to hear him. People say, well, you know, you ought to go down to Skid Row. You know, you ought to go down and talk to some of the drug addicts. You need to go and talk to some of the prostitutes. If they're interested in God, yes. But what you don't want to do is hang around with people uh, that are lost in sin, that are anti-God, because they will contaminate you. But these people came to him to be healed. So he sat with them and he did what he had to do for them. That's how it should work. 41, And Jesus, moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and saith unto him, I will, be thou clean. Just read it one more time. It's amazing. Jesus was moved with compassion. He was a man of many sorrows. He wept in John 11. Uh, I think it says only once he rejoiced, but for the most part, he was a man full of compassion, sorrows, and grief. And he moved forward, touched this man, and saith, I will be thou clean. You know, the, the Lord spoke the world into being, into creation, and here the Lord is speaking a man with leprosy uh, to be healed. By one word, by a touch, the man was made perfect. He was made whole. Amazing. 42. And as soon as he spoke, had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. Let me just say that, let me just stop here for a minute. Uh, I'll 42 one more time, because I think these verses need to be read uh, clearly and properly. And my apologies if I'm slightly uh, rushing these verses or not pronouncing them as well as I should do, but it's a bit windy up here, so I'll do the best I can. 42 one more time. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. Immediately. That's one of the main words found in Mark's Gospel. Immediately. 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 I remember when I got saved, maybe several months after I got saved, I had a friend of mine at the time and she wanted me to go and visit a friend of hers who was running a, a healing sanctuary, so-called. And uh, we drove down to this sanctuary miles away in the middle of the country and uh, we went into this massive area. It was a huge uh, piece of property. And uh, this friend of a friend, she was running the sanctuary, an elderly woman, maybe in her 70s, and she had a woman who was helping her run the sanctuary, and I got it pretty quickly on, it was a woman's sanctuary, you know, it was run by women, but it was for men as well, but predominantly it was run by women, and that's problematic, because women, you know, getting into healing, getting into ministry, getting into that type of thing, isn't really found in scripture, but anyway, I'll come back to that in a moment, so my friend and I, we got down there, and we had a cup of coffee, and then this lady came in, and uh, you know, I was listening to her, talking to my friend at the time, you know, about what her ministry entailed, and people had come from all over the world to be healed, so-called. And I'd been saved only a few months, and even at that stage in my my Christian, you know, new birth, you know, my new walk and relationship with the Lord, something didn't sound right to me. And I said to this woman, you know, how many people have you got staying here? And she said to me, oh, about two, three dozen people. And she said to me, they come for, some, some come for a week, some come for two weeks, and some have been here for six months. I thought, six months, wow. And they're paying, what, 200 pounds a week? You know, you do the maths. But uh, what I said to this, this lady who was running this sanctuary, so-called, is the gift of healing is immediate. I mean, if you claim to be able to heal these people, and she said she could, then these people should be healed immediately. Why are they coming back week after week, month after month? What's going on here? And I could tell she didn't like me. She, she didn't like me at all. In fact, I don't think she liked men in general. So I felt kind of uncomfortable. You know, I was one guy with three women, and I thought, they don't, this, this woman, you know, this lady who, who's running, who runs this sanctuary doesn't like me. I looked at my friend, and I said to her, she doesn't like me. <laughs> and she said, no, I don't think she does. And we carried on talking, the three of us, you know, about this ministry that she was running. And what we were doing, and I'd got saved maybe seven months earlier, and I got my friend saved uh, shortly after I got saved. So we were both quite happy at the time, both filled with happiness and joy of being born again. It was a great time, great experience. But I could see that I wasn't going to make much headway or much leeway with this, this, this individual. So I had my say, and the atmosphere was pretty bad. You could have cut it with a knife. I said to my friend, let's get out of here. <laughs> so we got back, you know, we got out, we got in the car, and we drove, we, we drove off, you know, we went off. And I wrote to that lady a few days later. When I was first saved, I wrote to a lot of people. I was a prolific writer, you know, and I used to write to people saying, you know, you, 
you believe you offer you know you offer this as a service and you offer that as a service and you believe this to be so and you believe that to be so blah 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 and you know, I was also learning at the time I wasn't sure you know if these people were genuine or not my gut feeling was that they weren't but I wasn't completely sure you know I was still developing as a, as a, as a Christian and I wrote a letter to this woman you know saying I don't think your ministry is biblical you know you don't seem to be able to heal people instant, uh, immediately instant you know the moment they believe and they come to you you know they should be healed and my letter is quite a long letter I'm just giving you a quick condensed account of what it you know what it entailed and I close the letter by saying you know I won't be coming back to your sanctuary not that she would have had you back anyway but you know I was laying out you know my argument that I didn't think she was genuine I think she was well intended but what she was doing what she was offering these people wasn't genuine you know it was more placebo and she phoned up my friend and she was in tears and she said to my friend at the time you know your friend has just phoned me you know so he's just written he just emailed me and he's told me that I'm not you know doing the Lord's work and he's condemning me which I wasn't condemning her by the way and he's saying you know that we shouldn't be doing this in reference to her and her friend her female friend blah 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 and you know it kind of upset my friend at the time she was upset as well and I said to listen what this woman's doing clearly isn't of the Holy Spirit and I'm saved, what, 12 years now? And I still don't think she was doing what she was doing through the Holy Spirit. I don't think any of these people do what they do through the Holy Spirit. When people came to be healed of the Lord Jesus Christ or his apostles, they were saved, A, straight away, and B, they were healed straight away. These people went to the sanctuary were not healed straight away. And, uh, you know, I just knew straight away that there was something not right here with these people. So that was my argument. That was my case. And here I am 12 years later, still very much with the mind set. Uh, that what was going on there was simply placebo. And she was making good money out of it too. But I don't think she was doing it for the money, to be fair to her. I think she was just uh, naive. She was just ignorant of the scriptures. And like I say, women in ministry, no. You know, if you're a woman, you can give out tracts. If you're a woman, you can tell people they need to be born again, they need to be saved. And you can share your testimony. But what you don't do is start opening up this book and start teaching it to men. No way. Not found in scripture. 43, and he straightly charged him, and forthwith sent him away, and saith unto him, See thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things, which Moses commanded for testimony unto them. These Jews were under the law, the temple was set in place, the Lord came to fulfill the law, not to destroy the law. And although the religious people, for the most part, had no idea as to who Jesus Christ was, or who God was, and most of them had come out of Babylon, and they'd retained a lot of their Babylonian influences, the Lord Jesus Christ is still upholding the law. Only when he dies on the cross and he says, Father, into thy hands I commit to my spirit. Only at that moment in time, only by the death of the tester, does the New Testament become valid. And the law therefore has been fulfilled. 45, but he went out and began to publish it much and to blaze abroad the matter, insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city, but was, but was without in desert places and they came to him from every quarter he didn't want to be made king he didn't want these people to come and uh, you know crown him Hosanna king of the, you know blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord that was going to happen later you know when he was going to be crucified but at this early time in his ministry he didn't want people to come and make a big song and dance as to who he was you know like I say son of David son of Joseph they will bend the knee at the second coming you know they will publicly proclaim him and you find that in Matthew 2 when the wise men arrive in Jerusalem looking for the king of the Jews and it, it says they went around asking everyone where he was and you know Herod got wind of it and Herod was terrified and Herod you know was just puppet leader he was a Gentile the Jews couldn't, couldn't stand him very much like the Pope of Rome or these Anglican priests today that have been imposed on the people and those that are born again can see through these fakes these imposters and uh, this Herod, awful man, like I say, you know, he was, a, he was a Gentile, he married his brother's sister, had a secret police, go and follow the wise men, and you know the rest. But the point I'm trying to make is that's a picture of the second coming. You know, a public arrival of the wise men with about several hundred armed guards. They travelled from Persia, from the east, to, to visit the king of the Jews. They bought gold, frankincense and myrrh. Second coming, you know, second coming, the kings of the nations are going to worship the Lord. They're going to bring him gifts. Whereas the rapture is a secret event. You know, when the the shepherds are sent to the inn in Luke chapter 2 to visit the newborn babe, only the shepherds go. A very intimate, private gathering, like the rapture found in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 
it's getting a bit uh, overcast now so I'll push on for as long as I can so that's mark one done pretty clear and you see very obviously how the Lord was a miracle maker and uh, Muhammad, was, Muhammad was asked to do miracles and he couldn't do miracles you know we've had what uh, they say 263 popes I think they say since the first century uh, if you want to believe that of course I don't but the church of Rome say they've had 260 plus Rome since, since 60 excuse me 260 popes excuse me since the first century and, I, and out of those 260 popes not one of them has ever done any healings any miracles why not you know they claim to believe in the sign gifts why are they doing miracles left right and center because they can't and all these ministries today which claim to believe in the Jewish apostolic sign gifts why aren't you busy I had a man come up in the street last weekend and he said to me, uh, he took a track from me first of all and he came back and he said to me, uh, he said, have you got the spirit? Have you got the spirit? And I knew what he meant and I said to him, yep, I got the spirit, I've been saved 11 years as of today, as of this year I've been saved 12 but this was just, just, uh, just before Christmas, shortly before Christmas and he said to me, have you got the spirit? and I said, yes, I got the spirit and I've been born again 11 years, blah blah and he said to me, do you speak in tongues? <laughs> and I knew he was going to ask me that. And I said to him, no. And this man was a rough diamond. You know, he looked like a boxer. He looked like he'd been, you know, through many war zones. And you shouldn't judge by appearance. You know, I'll grant you that. But my first impression of him was, you know, he, he doesn't look like a, a man of God. But anyway, you know, I give him the benefit of the doubt. And I said to him, yeah, I've been saved uh, 11 years. And uh, it's great to be saved. When did you get saved? And he said to me, I got saved back in the early 80s. I said, praise the Lord, good to meet you. And he said to me, do you speak in tongues? I said, no. And his whole countenance changed. And he said to me, excuse me, he said to me, you don't speak in tongues? I said, no. I said, tongues aren't for today. And he was about to blow his, his lid. His whole countenance changed, like I said. And he came a bit, bit more nearer to me. And he said to me, you don't speak in tongues? <laughs> And I said, no, I don't speak in tongues. It was, he was menacing. This man was menacing. And it, let's be a warning to you. You know, if you do street work, you've got to know how to handle people. And I said to him, uh, no, I don't speak in tongues. I said, tongues are no language. Acts chapter 2. And I said to him also, I don't think women spoke in tongues. And I'm not even sure that Gentiles spoke in tongues either. And he went back and forth with me for maybe 10 minutes. And I thought, look, I'm here to give out tracts. I'm not here to discuss theology with you. If this guy had been in a bar, sitting next to me, he wouldn't have given a second thought. He couldn't have cared less as to what I believed. But for some reason, when I'm on the streets giving out tracts, these people want to, you know, give me a Bible lesson. And I listen to people, you know, don't get the wrong impression. I'm not some, you know, arrogant, know-it-all guy. You know, I've only been saved 12 years, I'm still learning. You know, and if somebody can show me something, I'll listen to you. And I said to him, you know, I've been saved 11 years, blah, blah, blah. And tongues are known language, and I went off it with him. And uh, we went back and forth, like I say, and I said to him, no, can you do healings? You know, there's people that are sick that could be, you know, blessed by your healing. And he, he went on about, you know, what he was doing, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, you've got no tracks on you. You're not preaching to people. You're trying to waste my time. These people are all the same. These are so uh, unproductive people, these charismatics, stroke Pentecostals. They come up to you on the streets many times and they're just a waste of time. They're like talking shops. Anyway, we continued talking and I wrapped it up and I said to him, okay, I've got to get on now, you know, we've got work to do. And about 10 minutes later, he came over to where we were standing, Patrick and I, it was raining by this day, so we got out of the rain and we're standing under this atunda and I can see him walking towards me and he's waving his finger at me like this and he's saying to me, uh, uh, Cornelius got saved, Cornelius spoke in tongues, all this business. And, you know, I said to him, yeah, but Cornelius was a proselyte. You know, like those men that uh, Paul found in Acts 19. Cornelius was a, a Roman, yes. He was a Gentile, first of all. But he was a proselyte. He got saved. So technically, he's a Jew. Although he was a Gentile, he converted to Judaism. Another wind's picking up. Make of that what you will. And uh, he was quite angry with me. And I thought, he's obviously had some kind of religious experience in prison, perhaps. And he wants me to know how great he is, how holy he is. But no tracks on him, no preaching ministry. He's just want to waste his time 
given me a Bible lesson and I said to him, listen, Cornelius was a proselyte who spoke in tongues, yes, as did the men from Acts 19. But they were men. They were Jewish men. They had converted over to Judaism. And yet it's fair enough to say from Acts 19 that they didn't know who the Holy Spirit was. They weren't obviously Orthodox Jews. They hadn't been raised as Jews. They were Gentiles that got caught up in the, you know, the hysteria of the coming Messiah. They hadn't been schooled. A bit like Apollos. Uh, you know, from Acts 18. And, uh, you know, these people hadn't been schooled. And it fell down to the Apostle Paul to, uh, as I say, baptise them and give them the Gospel. But this man, like I say, was very upset with me, very angry with me. And, uh, you know, I just told him what I wanted him to know. And I find this a lot of these people, you know, they come up to me on the streets and they try to uh, argue with me <coughs> about everything. Excuse me. And, uh, you know, nothing happened, you know. I've never been assaulted, not yet. It's come near. I've been shouted at, I've been pushed, uh, or I've been, you know, uh, slightly uh, manhandled, perhaps. Not necessarily intentionally. But the point, the point I'm trying to make is, you know, these people that believe in the healings, you know, and the sign miracles and what have you, for the most part, they are completely worthless. You know, worthless ministries, worthless people. I don't say that to be, uh, you know, generally dismissive of them. I say it because it's a fact. And I speak from experience. But nothing happened, like I say. No, 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 I've never been assaulted yet. Not yet, anyway. But anyway, so that was my little, little encounter with that man a couple of weeks ago. Or about 10 days ago now, I think it was. And uh, off he went. And I've had many run-ins with these people over the years. And I just tell these people the same thing. You know, tongues is a known language. If you want to practice it, make sure it's known. Make sure it's never, never, never practiced where there are unsaved people present. Make sure you've got two or three interpreters with you. Never women. Uh, and do it in order. That's the, pre that's the clear layout from 1 Corinthians 14. Men, never women. No more than two or three. Never when, there, when, never when there are unsaved people present. And make sure, according to Acts 2, it's a known language. When you go down that line, these people just go crazy because it's gibberish, it's learned behaviour. And they don't follow that. These are crazy churches. Excuse me. And these churches are also ecumenical. They're into the interfaith movement as well, for the most part. So he went off very angry with me. And maybe he'll, you know, see the air of his ways and get right with the Lord. I don't know. But anyway, quick, quick detour, quick story to share with you all. Let's go to John, John chapter one. My battery is holding up, so that's pretty good. Let's get, let's go to John chapter one. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> John chapter one, verse one. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The beginning, the beginning of the ministry, uh, like my, uh, Mark one, the beginning of the Lord's ministry. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Jesus Christ being the Word, of course. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not made anything that was made. All things were made by him, and without him, Jesus, was not anything made that was made. He made everything. And I've, you know, I've made the argument over the last couple of videos, and even beyond that really, as to how Jesus Christ is God. He's called God here in verse 1 and verse 2. He's with God in the beginning, and through him, Jesus Christ, everything was made. Everything without exception. Verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. The just shall live by faith. 8. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. You saw it from Mark 1, and also from Matthew 3. How John was going to proclaim the coming of the King, the Lord, the Messiah. 9. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He lights every man that comes into the world. Every man has the, uh, the imprint, if you will, of Jesus Christ. They're not all going to be saved. The vast majority of people are not going to be saved, of course. But he lights every man that comes into the world. Every man that has been born and is going to be born has a knowledge as to who Jesus Christ is. And I've said this before and I'll say it again quickly that you, know, you go anywhere in the world, you mention Jesus Christ, for the most part people don't want to hear it. They get quite funny about it. And they'll curse that name. They won't curse Satan. You don't hear people saying, oh my Satan, you know, you know, Lucifer this or Lucifer that. But they'll curse Jesus Christ because he is the true God. 
and he lights every man that comes into the world. Verse 10, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He was in the world, the world was made by him, but the world did not know him. Like the Jewish Pharisees, you know, most of the Jews, like I said to you, didn't know who he was, didn't believe on him, died in their sins, and are in hell now. Not the second death, the first death. When he comes back at the second coming, most of the religious people living today, you know, or when he comes back, you know, whichever generation are alive when he comes back, are going to go into the lake of fire. Most people that speak about God don't know him. Most people that say, you know, they, they believe on him or they follow him, they don't, they don't follow him, they don't believe in him, they don't know him. That's a fact. Uh, 11. He came unto his own, and his own received him not, the Jews. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You are a son of God. Next time you meet somebody who says to you, what, you know, what do you believe? Tell them you are a son of God, and they will look at you like you've got two heads. I mentioned David Icke last time, you know, who was very uh, foolish when it came to deciphering Matthew's Gospel. And uh, Ike also thinks he's the son of God. And he made that claim back in the early or late 1980s. And he was laughed to scorn. But what he was really saying was that he's, he's divine. You know, he's a pantheist. He's saying he is one with God, whichever God he claims to believe. But here you are called a son of God. And you became a son of God by believing, again, on him. The just shall live by faith. My main theme from the book of Romans and it says in verse 13 one more time, which are born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. That's the source of the new birth. That's how you got saved. Verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word being God became flesh and dwelt among us. Zechariah chapter 2, read it please if you get a chance. I haven't got time to for today. Uh, verse 15, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. In every possible way was he before John. Of course he was. 16, And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by, by Jesus Christ. <laughs> One more time. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The Old Testament, of course, is Moses. The new covenant is grace. And Acts of the Apostles is very much a good place to go to see the transition from law to grace. Never mind going there for doctrine. If you want to get some doctrine into your system, go to Romans, go to Galatians, go to Ephesians, which is my next project, by the way. Verse 18, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. No man hath seen God the Father. I believe that. You're going to see him, Matthew 5 and the Millennium. But you haven't, seen, you haven't seen him yet. All the Old Testament appearances of deity that you read about are what you would call, or what we call, uh, are a Christophany. A Christophany. A pre-incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. When man came face to face with God in the Old Testament, he came face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ. But 18, no man hath seen God at any time. In reference, I believe, to God the Father. Verse 19, and this is a record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed, and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They thought he was Jesus. I mean, he's his second cousin. And they thought he was Jesus. I think when uh, it was uh, Herod, when he had uh, John put to death, he thought that Jesus, had, he thought that John had come back from the dead in the person of Jesus. These people believed in reincarnation. And he says, No, I'm not the Christ. 21. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. In reference to the Messiah, of course. 22. They said then unto him, so, excuse me, then said they unto him, Who art thou? That we may give an answer to them that sent us. What sayest thou of thyself? People still ask you that question to, that, to, you know, to this day. People say to me, you know, Where do you get your authority from, James, to do what you do? Scripture. I'm born again. Where do you get your authority from? You know, people, people can be quite uh, quick to question your authority. Like that man on the streets last week. You know, he wasn't questioning my authority, he was questioning my doctrine, which is fair enough. You know, I'm not above uh, examination. You know, you're told to examine everything in light of scripture. But when you get these, these apostates coming up to you, saying, where do you get your authority from? Turn the tables and ask them where they get, where they get their authority from. And they'll say, well, we get it from our church. Your church is false. Your church is built on Simon Peter, if you're a Roman Catholic. And uh, 
Simon in Greek is sand. You know, so you want to build your church on, a, on sand. According to Matthew 7, it's going to collapse. When the judgment comes, your, your church, your foundation needs to be built on Jesus Christ. He's the rock. Never mind Simon Peter. 23, he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Elias, or Isaiah, in reference to Isaiah, of course. Make way the highway of the Lord, Jehovah God. You can't get around it. I told you this last time, you know, these Old Testament scriptures point to deity. And he says here, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, the Lord, L-O-R-D, Jehovah, Elohim, Adonai, Jesus Christ, as said the prophet Isaiah, or Isaiah. 24, and they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him, and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? They thought he was Jesus, like I say. They were completely uh, ignorant as to who Jesus Christ was. And nothing has changed 2,000 years later. 26, John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it, I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethaba beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. I baptize you with water, H2O, but there stands one among you that you do not know, in reference to Jesus Christ. Again, John puts you into water. He prepares you for the coming Messiah, but Jesus Christ puts you into the Spirit. 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Jesus Christ takes, the sin of the he takes away the sin of the world. Not Mary, not the Pope, not the Mass, not me, not you, not even the King James Bible. Jesus Christ. 30. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man, which is preferred before me, for he was before me. He's eternal. Jesus Christ is eternal. He wasn't created at a point in time. Jesus Christ is eternal as God, the Son. God the man, or uh, Son of Man, I should say, yes. 4 BC he was conceived, he was born. Uh, he was born, I should say, in 4 BC to Mary. We, we saw that last time. But Jesus Christ, as God the Son, is eternal. 31, and I knew him not, but that, but that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore am I come baptizing with water. I didn't know him, but he should be made manifest to Israel. He came to the Jews first of all, we saw that, but the Jews did not receive him. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. 32, and John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him, and I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending, and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. Of course. As I said to you, Jesus Christ will baptize you uh, with the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. And this is also a public show as to who Jesus Christ was. Nothing here was done in secret or behind closed doors, unlike what you find in uh, you know, Masonic lodges all over the world. 34, and I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. John was one of the first people to recognise the deity of Christ. When you get to Matthew 16, and Jesus says to Peter, you know, who do men, who, whom do men say that I am? He's asking all the apostles. He says to the apostles, tell me, you guys, who do people say that I am? And Peter speaks for all of the apostles, and he says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he says to Peter, you know, upon this rock I build my church. On the profession of faith that Peter has declared, was the Lord Jesus Christ going to build his church? Not in Peter per se. Like I said, Peter uh, in Greek means sand. But on what Peter said was enough for the Lord to build his church, as it were. And it's built on the prophets and the apostles, with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. But John was one of the first people to recognise who Jesus Christ was. 35, again the next day after John stood, and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. He's reaffirming it. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Follow Jesus. Follow him. Follow him to the cross. Follow him to the ends of the earth, if you need to. But follow him. It's all about Jesus. 38, Then Jesus turned, and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? Where do you stay? Where are you staying? Where do you live? We want to follow you. 39. He saith unto them, Come and see. And they came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. What an amazing experience to meet the Lord, to dwell with him, and to become his apostles. Verse 40. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. 
he first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ, another one who recognised the Lord's deity. Andrew, not Peter. 42. And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone, a little stone. And Peter causes the eldest out of the apostles, hence why he's given a new name. But don't forget, James and John were given new names, they were called sons of thunder, it wasn't just Peter that got a new name. 43. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee, and findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law, and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Again, son of Joseph, son of David. And they're focusing primarily on his first coming. They got that down, the suffering saviour. 46, And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael come to him, and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no gill. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered, and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered, and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered, and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. What an amazing end to John chapter 1. The Lord Jesus Christ is omnipresent. He saw Nathanael under the fig tree. And when Nathanael realised that, he says in verse 49, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Very much in reference to the Son of David. In fact, in just three or four verses from verse 45, they've gone from recognising him as the Son of Joseph, which of course he was, to the Son of David, which I mentioned last time, in reference, of course, to the Second Coming. And he ends this uh, chapter in verse 51. And I say unto you hereafter, ye, all of you, shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. A picture very much of Jacob's ladder, and Jesus Christ becomes a ladder. He becomes a bridge between heaven and earth. And he's the only mediator that we ever need to deal with. Like I said to you also, when you have the Queen's phone number or the President's phone number, you go straight to them. Never mind wasting time going to third parties. But here Nathaniel, along with John the Baptist, along with Andrew, recognises that Jesus Christ is God Almighty. And uh, when you pull all these verses together, you can see the full majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just a quick footnote before I conclude this video, I mentioned earlier on about the lady who ran that ministry, the so-called healing ministry. She was also running a baptism ministry and I was rather critical of that as well because baptism, like uh, ministry in general, I think falls to an elder, not a woman. So you can understand why she was somehow upset with me. But nevertheless, you know, I speak my mind. I don't, uh, I don't sort of start out to be controversial just for the sake of it. But I take the Bible very seriously, you know, and she got upset with me and my friend was upset because she was upset and it was a bit of a palaver, but it all resolved itself in the end, I think, anyway. Before this video concludes, I want to squeeze in Zechariah chapter 2. I mentioned it a little earlier on and I wasn't sure if I had enough time to look at it, but I do. Zechariah chapter 2, in reference to John chapter 1 verse 14, where the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, the Word being Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, we found in John chapter 1 verse 1, is the Word, the Word being God. Zechariah chapter 2, look at verse 10, please. Zechariah 2 verse 10. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, in reference to Jehovah God. Verse 11. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day and shall be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto thee. Jesus Christ speaking in reference to God the Father. Verse 12, And the Lord shall inherit Judah his portion in the Holy Land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. Be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord, 
for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. Verse 10 in reference to the first coming and verses 11 down to 13 I believe in reference to the second coming. Put these verses together, you see one more time, the son of Joseph and the son of David and how the Lord Jesus Christ as God, as man, had two parts very much in reference to his two comings. But going back to John chapter 1 just very quickly as I say, the Lord saw Nathaniel under the fig tree, and that shows he was God Almighty, that he is God Almighty. He was able to see what Nathaniel was doing, and he says, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guilt, no deceit. What a wonderful thing to say of a saved person. And uh, this will be a conclusion, I suppose, to my two-part video. Last time we looked at Matthew 1 and Luke 1, and this video we looked at uh, Mark 1 and John 1. Just a taster. And like I said to you earlier, this is a special New Year's week video. We're now well into 2014, and if you're looking to get your teeth into something, if you're looking to do something for the Lord, if you're looking to get deep into the scriptures, this video should be a blessing to you. One of my future projects is to go through the entire four Gospels and do a much more in-depth study. I'm not sure when I'll do it. That would be quite a deep project. But uh, either way, what you've had from me for today and from last time, is a substantial blessing to you all I hope anyway and it's getting rather windy now rather blustery uh, it's still mild like I say there's no snow there's no ice but there is a storm on the way and uh, I'm going to wrap this video up speak to you all very soon and may the Lord bless you and Maranatha